Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the third of our CPX conversations. Uh, the first one we had Andy Crouch talking about technology and being human. Second up was Justine Toe talking about achievement addiction. You can catch up on either of those on Facebook or at YouTube. And the third one today, we're going to be talking to Mark Stevens about his book in the series, in the Reconsidering series, The End of Thinking. Great to see you there, Mark. It's good to be here, Simon. Now, Mark, uh, great addition to the, to the series. Uh, you've chosen thinking. What are you meaning by that, though? Like, are you talking about, oh, we're off at university thinking deep thoughts all the time, or is it something other than that? Yeah, it'd be horrifying if I was saying that we're all going to sit and do armchair philosophy. No, thinking, I'm talking about what we do in the everyday. I'm talking about all of our decision making, whether we're thinking about our money or our family or our medical decisions or our schooling decisions. Every decision we make involves our mind. And that's the kind of thinking that I'm looking at in this book. Now, you tell a story early in the book at your own expense to illustrate how thinking can go off track even when we like to think we're reasonably sensible people and that it's circumstances that can often impact our thinking in a manner that ends up being not helpful. Yeah, so uh, my wife and I were taking a trip to the United States many years ago and we're going to Memphis and she's a massive Elvis fan and so it was a really important part of the trip, but I wanted to save money. And so I decided to book a hotel three miles out of downtown because it was way cheaper. And then when we got there, I ended up realising that we're going to have to spend money on cabs every single time we wanted to go in and out of downtown. But that's okay. We started to do it. We went in and out of town. And one night I'm coming out of downtown and I go to pay the cab driver for the evening fare. And instead of giving him like $7 with US money, I give him $27 because it's easy to mistake US money, one and twos and fives and tens and twenties. They all look the same in the dim light. And so I end up giving him this massive tip and he drove off the happiest cab driver in Memphis and I am seething. So the next night we're in downtown having paid our cab fare again. And there I am waiting to get a cab back out to our hotel, which seems so far away now. I'm out the front of a Greyhound bus shelter looking for a deal. And this guy walks up to me in dirty jeans, a tattered leather jacket, missing most of his teeth and says, do you want to ride? And at that point, for some strange reason, I said, how much? And he offered me a price that was a whole, get this, Simon, $1 under what I would have paid if I used a cab. And I said, you have a deal, sir. And so we get into this beaten up old Pontiac. The steering wheel is gaffer taped to the column. Uh, The guy's got to go and get the keys because he doesn't actually have the keys. So he's probably stolen the car. And for the next 10 minutes, we're driving up the road to this place in Memphis, wondering if we're going to live. And at the end of it, we get out of the car, hug each other. And my wife wants to kill me because I've just risked her life to save a buck. And whenever I tell that story to friends, They look me in the eye and they say to me, Mark, what were you thinking? And I have no good answer for them. Yes, remind me not to go traveling with you, Mark. You sound like you're sort of sacrificing any sort of uh, luxury and enjoyment for saving a few dollars. So is is that pretty much? Pretty much. (laughs) Yes. If I can save a buck, I will take any risk. Feels like that story could have ended a lot worse than it did. But, uh, What do we like at thinking, Mark? So plenty of us these days like to express an opinion. It's often firmly held. But what might be some of the limitations uh, that you're identifying in terms of our thinking? Yeah, we have these enormously powerful minds and we also have these enormously powerful voices with which we can share what's on our mind. But we do have lots of limitations in our thinking. We have a number of tendencies that often recur. So, for example, we often think with our gut first rather than our mind first. So we have a feeling, a general kind of intuition about how we might want to go on a particular decision. And then what usually happens is we use our mind to justify the decision our gut has already made. Or alternatively, sometimes we might have an opinion about something But we have that opinion on the basis of a really small amount of reading or thinking about something. So we might have really strong opinions on politics or we might have really strong opinions on parenting. 
but it's on the basis of like one web article that we've read or one blog post or one person who talked to us one time. Yeah, it's, I feel like I'm a bit like this when I'm watching my favourite football team play. Uh, the referee's decisions seem to be ones that uh, land in a certain direction from me and might be different for, from others. Um, but what else? What other limitations? Because uh, we like to think we've got a good handle on things, but you're trying to paint a bit of a picture, at least initially in this book, of where we go, oh, we might want to re- reconsider uh, the ways in which our thinking can be clear and accurate and heading towards something like truth. Yeah, so one of the things that we don't understand is the way that psychology influences. So so that was what I was referring to with the fact that we often talk uh, or often think with our gut first rather than our mind. But also it's just how easy we are to be mistaken. So, for example, lots of the ways that we think in the world use statistics. You know, those wonderful numbers and pie charts and graphs. And One of the interesting things about statistics is it's easy to be hoodwinked by statistics. It's easy to be convinced of something, whether you're buying a home loan or whether you're trying to work out the efficacy of a vaccine. You can you can be hoodwinked if you don't actually understand how statistics works. And so that can be a really difficult thing to cope with that. I don't always have the expertise to be able to evaluate all the information. Yeah, th- absolutely. This is the same thing holds even when we do attend to experts because it's like, which expert will I choose? And often we might tend to choose the one that supports something we all, a view that we already hold, right? Yes. So we're in the middle of a moment right in the world where we've got a pandemic happening and there are so many experts who are so important to us in the way that we respond to that pandemic. But the interesting thing about those experts is they don't all agree. It's not that any of them are particularly dumb, but that they don't all agree. They have different opinions. And what we can sometimes do in those situations is we have a gut intuition about what kind of conclusion we want to reach. And then we just pick our favorite expert who supports our point of view in order to back up the decision we've already made. So it's an interesting moment that we can actually then take our gut decisions and kind of take them to the level of expertise by finding the expert that supports our point of view. One of the things, though, you talk about in the book is that we we need to sort of make recognise the ways in which we don't know most things. Like we might have a bit of expertise in a particular narrow area, but usually we're just relying on other people. And I suppose it's a, there's a bit of an art to kind of getting the right voices and perhaps reading and, and hearing from a variety of voices too, isn't it? Yeah, that can be a really tricky thing. I mean, in terms of who we are, it's really hard to be smart about everything. There is no such person who's a meta expert, who's an expert in everything, despite people on talkback radio being able to offer opinions about everything. We can't normally do that. Uh, I only know a lot about a very small amount of topics. There's a few things that I know a little bit about and can comment fairly intelligently on. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff from cooking all the way through to fixing my car that I really have no area of expertise in. And it can be hard to admit our limitations on that because in the modern world, it feels like you've got to know about everything in order to be able to navigate the world. And that means we do have to rely on experts, but we also have to know that those experts can be wrong and to be humble about being open to the fact that they can be corrected and new information can come available. One part of me is getting a bit depressed here because I'm starting to think, well, what, what hope have we got here to, to think well? But, but you've identified some ways you think, actually, we can improve our thinking. Totally. So th- it's very easy when you look at the capacity of humans to fail at thinking, to throw up your arms in despair and to think we will never, ever be able to arrive at truth together. And yet the story of human beings is that we've been able to find out lots of great things and do lots of great things with our minds throughout history. But what are the character traits that enable us to do that the best? And the kinds of things that I'm looking at in the book are not so much strategies to know that you'll always be right, but the character of a thinker and how that actually determines finding out truth together. And I look at three different aspects of thinking that are often not attended to, and they are humility, hospitality, and love, uh, because each of those 
are character traits that help us be better thinkers and take the right posture and enable us to learn truth together with other people. Yeah, okay, well, let's, let's have a quick look at each of those. Humility, what do you mean by that when, we're, when it comes to organising ourselves in, our, in terms of our thinking? Yeah, so humility is really uh, being able to recognise our limitations. So we've spoken about our limitations. It's actually not being down on your thinking to be humble, but to be aware that it may not be right. So to always be able to walk into a situation and to make the comment that I hope I'm right on this, but I'm open to being corrected. Uh, there are some people who use the slogan, uh, argue like you're right, but listen like you're wrong. Uh, always be open and humble enough that you could be corrected. So humility is trying to recognize our limitations. It's not saying you're always wrong. It's saying you could be wrong. And how are you building uh, habits into your life to be open to correction? Yeah, and presumably there's certain areas where that becomes more kind of fitting than others. So if I'm doing the equation to get the aeroplane wing right, <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm, I really need that to be absolutely precise and and uh, test that. But if I'm talking to you about a relational thing, maybe even a political or social thing, there's, probably, where there's so many sort of different perspectives and grey areas, perhaps there too there's a special need for that kind of humility in the way you've described it. Yeah, and it's not a humility that's designed to make you paralysed from doing anything. I mean, yeah. if you are always afraid of being wrong, you'll never get out of bed in the morning, you'll never eat your breakfast and you'll never make a decision in your life. It means being open to the fact that I could have made the wrong decision or I could have made a slightly wrong decision or I'm open to hearing other voices give me a different perspective on things, but I can still actually also go back and think, I actually probably got it right on that one, but I got it wrong on this one. It's about a habit. It's about a character. It's about a posture rather than some sort of a formula. It's one that's not particularly common, especially when we think about the polarizing nature of the way discussions happen these days. So I think that's a very helpful way to think of it. Okay, I love this one, hospitality. This was really interesting to me. Yeah, so hospitality in uh, the way we think about it in terms of eating together is when you eat with strangers. So hospitality mm -hmm. isn't so much about eating with friends, it's about welcoming people who are presently strangers and making them friends by having dinner or lunch with them. But the idea of intellectual hospitality, hospitality of the mind, is about being able to listen to people who are very, very different from you, who you might find very strange, who have a very different perspective and keeping yourself open to alternative perspectives, not because you're listening to them means that they're right, but because it awakens you to the fact that not everybody sees the world the way you do. So we live in a world where our technology encourages us to live in an echo chamber. On Facebook, we pick our friends. On Twitter, we pick our feed. We can curate our news feed. We can live in our own bubble and never be challenged by any strange ideas. But my encouragement would be, you want to read perspectives that are very different from your own in order to be able to see the world, put on a different set of glasses and see, hey, in light of that person's perspective, do I maybe need to revise my own perspective? Because it might well be that their opinion actually sharpens up yours in ways that you never quite expected. Yeah, that's very nice. It takes a bit of work and a bit of intentionality, doesn't it, these days especially. Um, and then the third thing, Love. How can the, we be loving? You know, yeah, so the third thing is is love, which is the idea of why am I thinking? So what is the aim of my thinking? What's the end of my thinking? So a lot of people, when they're using their mind, probably have the goal that I just want to be proven to be right, even that I just want to be seen to be right. I want everybody in the argument, I want everybody at the dinner party to say, you know what, you're right. But that's actually a terrible goal for our thinking. Even if we want to be right, why do we want to be right? We want to be right in order to help serve other people. We want to be helpful with our minds. And so love prioritizes that I want to think and find the truth and make good decisions in order to not only be helpful to myself, but also to be helpful to other people. And that will change the way that we have conversations. It will change the way that we have arguments. 
it'll change the way that we want to be right within this world because love prioritizes how am I helping and serving others rather than how am I making myself look smart in other people's eyes. Yeah, there's a lovely uh, element to this, which is um, improving our thinking and knowledge, growing in those things so that we can enrich other people's lives uh, rather than just you know, weaponize it for ourselves. I thought that was a really nice part of part of the book. And perhaps lastly, Mark, um, tell us about the way your faith has informed your perspective on this topic. Certainly. Yeah, my faith informs so much of what is written in this book. Uh, particularly those three attributes of humility, hospitality, and love, they're the attributes I see in the way that Jesus uses power in uh, the New Testament. So I see a Jesus who not only models this, but calls people who follow him to live a life of humility, of hospitality, and of love, and to make those kinds of character traits the defining traits of everything that we do within the world. And because I believe that Jesus is a significant person, indeed I believe he is the Son of God, it encourages me to think that this is actually the way the world works best, that this is how life is, and that if I live a life of humility, hospitality, and love, then I'm actually working with the grain of the universe and the way that life is meant to work. So it encourages me to take the courage of using my mind in these ways and not having to fear when I lose that argument or maybe when I don't look as smart as I could because I'm encouraged that following this path is actually the way that life is lived at its best. Yeah, it's a real picture of a, a fullness of life and serving other people, not only in our actions but in the way we think. I think it's a really timely book, Mark, and uh, been great chatting to you about it today. Thanks so much. Thanks very much for having me, Simon.